Hey! I hope you're ready for round two of Startup Battlefield. I'm ready for it. This group of companies are from all over the world. We have companies from Dubai, from London, from Nigeria, and this crazy place called San Francisco. So with that, I would like to just to get started. I don't think we need to do any more intros because you're going to see the companies yourself. Okay, so to meet the judges first, we have five judges. We're gonna bring them out one by one. We have Ann Burdinsky and join NEA as a partner in 2001 and focuses on consumer and enterprise technologies with a particular focus on the future of work, commerce, and platforms. Anne has helped build some of Silicon Valley's most iconic companies in a variety of businesses, strategies, and operating executive roles, and has been a leading force in catalyzing diversity in tech as an operator, angel investor, and advisory to January Ventures. Next, we have Mandela Schumacher Hodge Dixon, CEO of All Rays. Mandela is the CEO of All Rays, a nonprofit on a mission to accelerate the success of female and non binary founders, investors, and operators in tech. Mandela's career in the tech industry began when she dropped out of her PhD program at the age of 25 to start her own company and became one of the first black women to raise capital in Silicon Valley. Before All Rays, Mandela was the founder and CEO of Founder Gym, the number one training program teaching underrepresented founders how to raise venture capital. And she has great energy too, so I'm so happy she's here. Next, we have Nisha Dua. Nisha is the managing partner at BBG Ventures, which she co-founded in 2014. BBG B is it N is a New York City-based, early-stage funding-led investments in companies built by female and diverse founders that are solving the needs of consumers, workers, and employees at BBGV. Nisha also invested in over 100 female-led startups, including Spring Health, Real, Fiveable, KiwiCo, Blue Land, and The Mom Project. Next, we have Dave Samuel, general partner at Freestyle. Dave is the found. yeah, yeah, there you go is a founding partner at Freestyle VC, a seed stage venture capital firm with over 450 million under management and investments in over 125 startups. After graduating from MIT undergrad and working at Oracle for one year, Dave co-founded Spinner, the first internet radio service. In 1995, it was acquired by AOL for 320 million and Crackle, an internet video service, which was acquired by Sony for 65 million in 2004. Last, we have Lo Tony. Lo is the founding manager at partner at Plexo Capital, which he incubated and spun out from GV based on a strategy to increase access to early stage deal flow. Plexo Capital invests in emerging seed stage VCs and invests directly into companies sourced from the portfolios of VCs where Plexo Capital has an investment. I'm glad that part's done. Okay, with that, let's bring out the very first company for round two of Startup Battlefield. At Disrupt 2022. From New York, New York, we have Mother Honestly. Presenting for Mother Honestly is founder and CEO, Blessing Adacian. Come on out. This is Tayo. This was our very first day of kindergarten. I miss this moment, though. I was traveling for work for two weeks. But what was more painful was that my employer could not support my childcare needs at any point during these two weeks. So I left the workplace. I'm not alone. 5.8 million women were forced out of the workforce in 2020 due to the care crisis. And 2.3 million women are still missing from the workforce today. Before you think this is a woman's issue though, men are actually stepping up at home, doing more housework and childcare, and that is starting to affect their productivity as well. Masses of boomers now need elder care provided by your employees. And companies are actually stepping up, providing various perks and services. However, only 6% of employees are utilizing this service today. I spoke to a CEO last week and he said, blessing. You have to understand this. I provided backup care to my employees. And in a single year, not one of my employees utilized this service. 
Well, that begs the question, why? Well, employers, instead of making assumptions about what you think your employee needs, give them the choice to pick what they need to thrive at home and in the workplace. Introducing the Mother Honestly Work-Life Wallet. Move to demo, please. Let me show you how this works. Employers, instead of throwing away millions of dollars to EAP programs that your employees are not using, you can redirect all of that cash and place it directly into the hands of your employees. Here, I'll show you. I'm going to provide $100 to 10 of my employees, including myself. Great, that was fast. Now let's move over to the employee work-life dashboard. Your employee will actually see their balance that you have provided to them. And they will also see their recent transactions. Looks like I spent some money at Rover and Care.com and Papa for Elder Care. Great. To their right, they will also see merchants that may come in handy for care. Now let's move over to the work-life wallet. Employers, your employees can link their bank account or debit card directly on their, on their dashboard, and they can see recent transactions that they, that they have spent on work-life-related expenses. And in the back end, what we do is actually screen and qualify transactions from their bank account or debit card that are related to care. It looks like I have 12 eligible transactions. Let's check those out. Okay, great. I spent $20 for housekeeping while I was working at home. We're all working from home today. So let's reimburse for that. Great. I'm going to pick the household category. And I want full reimbursement. And I can provide a description around the expense. Awesome. Now, employers, your employee can also find various care merchants within our platform. They don't need to go anywhere. It's personalized and localized to their experience. My mom lives with us, and we are traveling for Thanksgiving, and I'm going to need elder care. I choose Papa. Perfect. Now, employers, I want to show you one more thing, because care doesn't just end with the work-life wallet. It is time we lead with care in the workplace and bring our humanity into the remote and distributed workforce. Through our one-on-one -on -one work life connection, your leaders and your employees can come together to discuss how they're living their lives outside of work. You know, enough with the inspiration. We need to get real about how, what really drives our success. Now, let me show you what the employers see. This is amazing. I love it. Employers, for the first time ever, you now have data and insights about the caregiving responsibilities of your employees. And you can see exactly where you are reducing the pain points and where you're reducing, you can, you can see the pain points and where you're reducing the care load. I mean, you can also take a wider lens to see the various spectrum of care within your organizations, whether it's child care. Here we have 45% of our workforce with children between zero to five. So that allows us to plan, right, the company retreat, not during back to school season. And we also know that 15% are, have aging parents. And we can now see how much our employees are actually spending on care. Back to slides, please. Employers, you can now see how we're going to use, how your employees use various, um, their work life expenses. And we want to replicate this for 160 million employees across the country. The care economy is $648 billion alone. Employers, the future of work is care. And now is the time to bring care into your workplace. Thank you. Wonderful. Give a round of applause. Blessing, I, I, you didn't see this because you were so busy, but these judges were all leaning forward and they were so involved in your demo. It was great to see. <coughs> all right. Who wants to go first? Mandela. Yeah, sure. Great presentation. Um, 
I am a mom of two kids under three. I'm a CEO, I'm an employer. So, so much of what you are focused on and bringing the humanity into the workplace and serving the whole person really resonates with me in this season of my life. So thank you for your focus. My first question and probably my only question is how do you all vet the reimbursements and approve them? So, so many people are submitting things. Who is vetting and what's the process? So on the back end, we have a catalog of various personal care, household care, um, various type of care, um, and various merchants. So when, when those um, transactions come in, we're able to very quickly filter if this is a work-life related expenses. So you can actually get that Gucci that you bought um, reimbursed. Ann? Plus one to Mandela. I'm a mom, so I love it. Um, this problem needs to be solved. How do you help your customers, the employers, think about ROI, their return on this kind of employee spend and keep them coming back and spending and supporting their employees? Absolutely. So a lot of time, employers don't, they, they have no idea um, the percentage of employees that they have that have caregiver responsibilities. And they are not able to prevent care disruptions or even prevent a care crisis, for example. Um, we, we all saw the formula crisis. I mean, how cool will it be if I could just go to the store, grab a formula with my work-life wallet? Um, but so the ROI is there, right? Immediately, the employee actually utilized this. Again, remember where we started from, 6% are they, we only have 6% utilizing this. And so when people actually use it for care and you know exactly what they're using it for, you understand immediately the ROI and you can see the impact because your employee will show up at work knowing that they've been taken care of. Dave? Uh, we're a big fan of what we call the B to B to E, so business to business and then to employee. Can you talk just a little bit about for the business target, what is, as you look out over the next year or two, what kind of businesses are you targeting, like SMB or 50 to 500, or what do you think the size is for where you're targeting? We're targeting a wide range of employees, um, and, and of course, a wide range of businesses. Um, you know, for example, Meta provides childcare stipends to their employees. I think it's about $3,000, and not a lot of people actually submit receipts for reimbursements, for example, because they forget, they lose it, they're not sure if this, it's for this year or for last year, and so we're targeting companies like that. We already work with companies, for example, like Indeed, um, that have a remote and distributed workforce. Those are the kind of companies we're targeting. Thank you. Hello. Great presentation. Um, thanks for coming out and presenting to all these people. That takes a lot of, uh, you have to be courageous to do that, so thanks for that. My question. Yeah, Lo, you might need to move the mic closer oh, to your mouth. We want to hear better? you. Better? Oh, I don't think it's. Oh, there, there, there we go. go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just said, congrats. Thanks for coming out. Courageous to present to all these people and us. My question is around just the customer development process. And I'm just curious to know whether or not there was any insight that was gleaned in talking to the, the customers, the, the B customers. Mm -hmm. that provided this aha moment to say, oh my God, this is like changing the whole strategy or wow, this really validates. Like what was like some of the key insights that you were able to pull out? Absolutely. So we started out as a community actually um, and we reached about a million mothers in the United States alone. And those mothers literally dragged us to the employers. And we spoke to employers and we said, how can we support you? And they said, blessing, we want you to actually help us beg our employees to utilize their employee assistance programs. And that was when we were like, okay, what's going on there? And we started doing the research, talking to moms, and they said, look, we would, you know, we want backup childcare, but it's not available in our area. And so the company actually provides this benefit, but I actually cannot utilize it. We spoke to men who said, well, I paid for Jim's services, but now I can't find my receipt, so I can't have it reimbursed. Um, so, you know, companies are telling us that, can you please help us? And so that was where we started getting the voice of the customer and it was very helpful in putting this together. That was great. Thank you. Nisha? Hey, Blessing. Thanks for the presentation. Um, we're spending a lot of time in the care and the benefits economy as well. Um, I'm curious, who is the buyer at the company when you approach them? And are you hearing much about, oh, well, we have all these other benefits. We're spending this much money on mental health, this much money on elder care. We don't have room for a new product. Or what, what's the response you're getting from companies? 
Absolutely. Um, so when we speak to companies, we speak to mostly HR. Um, we also speak directly to the CEOs. Um, luckily for us, we have a great community um, of women that lead us directly to their CEOs. Um, but I, I agree with you. A lot of companies push back, right, saying, oh, you know, we're spending all of this money. And we ask them, OK, sh show us the ROI. How many people are actually utilizing the service? Because it's not fair that companies are spending this money and the people that actually are falling off the edge, leaving the workforce, don't even have access to it. And so what we're saying is let's take away all this middlemen and place the money directly into the hands of these women. And we screen and qualify those expenses. Yeah. And one follow-up question. What's your business model? How are you guys making money? So we charge about 2 to $4 per employee per month. Um, and that is outside of what the employee actually contributes into the, into the program. Great, thanks. Great. Give her a round of applause. Big energy. Well done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Blessing. Next up, from Dubai, we have Digest Technology. Presenting for Digest Technology's founder and CEO, Kittis Patavida. Come on out. A decrease of 50%. No, I'm not talking about my stock portfolio. I'm talking about something much, much worse. Our attention spans. My generation has half the attention span that the generation before me did. I noticed this extremely prevalent in school when I had 600-page textbooks to learn, and I spent two hours a day creating my own summaries, my own flashcards, and every now and again pleading and begging my friends for help. How? Do you convince a generation that spends, two hours, that spends eight hours a day on Snapchat and TikTok to spend two hours a day on a textbook, especially when the competition for attention today is so fierce? Meaning that a book that looks like this to you feels like this to me. So I thought to myself, what if we could make learning personalized? What if we could make learning addictive? Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time ever, I'd like to publicly launch Digest AI. We're building generative AI to help students learn faster and help teachers teach faster. Move to demo, please. Our initial product, Kado, allows students to create flashcards with just a picture of their textbooks. All you have to do is point it at the text you want to, you want to scan, and we use OCR to grab the words out of the textbook. In the background, our machine learning model creates questions and answers by knowing what's most important for you and what's not. As you can see, it's being resized. The OCR picks up the text. We categorize to whatever you'd like it to categorize it on. And in a matter of mere seconds, you get flashcards. This was a process that took me two hours in school, now being done by our users in less than 30 seconds. Back to presentation, please. Kado today has over 70,000 beta users and over 650,000 resources generated. Despite the overwhelmingly positive response we got when we launched, we realized something. Our attention wasn't where we wanted it to be. So we, we went back to the drawing board and went to, to what students do most. What do students spend eight hours a day on? Snapchat and TikTok and other messaging apps. Back to demo, please. So for the first time ever again, I'd like to introduce Milo. Milo is a virtual learning assistant that acts as a tutor in your pocket. Not only do you get the basic fundamentals that Kado had, where you get questions and answers instantly generated, except this time, all you need to do is send a, 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 a word rather than copy-paste the text itself. As you can see, we'll get questions and answers generated on the blockchain in mere seconds. Not just that, we've extended our use cases to more than just flashcards. Students can now get help with an essay, for example. So in a matter of mere seconds, once again, we'll get talking points on an essay about inflation. This was, again, a process that took me hours and hours when I was still in school. 
Back to presentation, please. Now, this is all made possible because we specialize in language. We, we use semantic understanding to silo language models and process information in a way that very few models do today. This is done, instead of, instead of usual prompt engineering, this is done using, by uh, training task-specific behavior in the model itself. We're able to do this with the data that we collected from Kado itself, and now expanding it ac across use cases by recruiting ambassadors. Our models run faster than any other model for the specific use case that we've developed it for. In fact, our Q&A generation algorithm takes 200 milliseconds to create questions and answers, whereas the next industry benchmark is 1,200 milliseconds. But what does this mean? Oh, could you go back, please? Well, it means we have a fantastic, seamless user experience. But who are we to judge what a fantastic, seamless user experience is? Well, we are our own user. Me and my co-founders are 19 years old and dropped out of university to focus on what's important, building an information pipeline that not just we could use, but our peers could use. We also recently hired Shansa Kabwe, um, uh, an, an AI researcher who previously developed the mathematical model uh, for the AI model for mathematical reasoning at the University of South Africa, and he exploded us to an entire new dimension. We now use our AI models beyond just students, and we're able to service workplace and, workplace and training. Oh, go back, please. We now have three paid pilots, two with universities in the US and Italy, where we're using our algorithms and our models to distill their knowledge repositories. We're also working with one of the largest companies in Europe to use our algorithms to create instant training resources for their employees. In fact, your employees deserve the same thing. If you're interested in building out a seamless learning experience for, all of your, for your workforce and upskilling them as fast as possible, please scan the QR code or go to our website at digest.ai and sign up. Thank you. All right, give them a round of applause. I make so many flashcards for my teenagers. I'm so excited about this. Okay, who's first? Anne? Um, that was great. Thank you. I love the idea of addictive learning. Um, I think that's really interesting. How do you think about creating a network effect from the knowledge base and the screenshots that users are contributing to the product. Is there a network effect? And if so, how does it work? Yes, certainly there is a network effect. In fact, if I ask Milo for talking points in an essay again, my talking points would actually become better. Uh, what we're doing now is incorporating a positive feedback loop. That way we know what data is good and what data is bad, because the winner in generative AI is going to be the one with the, most, with the best feedback loop. We're able to do this seamlessly because of the chat interface, where it feels like you're almost talking to the AI. Um, so yes, uh, that is something we think about, yeah. And is the knowledge uh, base user generated or AI generated or both? So um, initially it's user generated. We fine tune the models on uh, real user based uh, uh, data as well as textbooks and other educational materials out there. Um, but then eventually, um, you know, we're also planning on using the AI that we, once the AI is trained to a sufficient amount of extent, uh, we're, using, we're planning on using it to create our data pipeline as well. Thank you. Nisha? Thanks for the presentation. Uh, love this arena. Um, one of the hardest things we've observed in this space is that the promise of the idea is sometimes ahead of the execution of the idea. Um, so you have 70,000 beta users. Can you share a little bit about um, some of your hero stats? Like what is your churn been since you launched or maybe something like the number of flashcards per person or daily actives or weekly actives, tell us more about the traction. Yeah, so with Kado, uh, we did get traction. Like I said, we have over 70,000 beta users, but Kado wasn't the best product we put out. Uh, what we noticed with retention and churn was it wasn't good. Um, that's why with Milo, we've sort of addressed those concerns. The average user spent seven minutes on Kado, and now they spent 45 minutes on, on Milo. So we're, that's the sort of improvement we're seeing by moving from a, a graphical user interface to a chat interface and making students feel like they're almost talking to a tutor. I mean, that's our vision, is putting a tutor in everybody's pocket. Thanks. Dave? I have five teenagers that I manage in my household, and you are correct. It is a short <laughs> attention span. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the competitive landscape? Are, you, uh, are, are, you, are people upgrading from an existing service, or just tell me a little bit about players within the space? 
Right, so um, with education technology and mostly with high school and universities, it's uh, deeply fragmented. So students are using you know, six to 12 platforms to get everything they need in the school year. Our goal with Milo is to make sure it's only one platform. So yes, with Kado, for example, students were switching over from platforms like Anki and Quizlet uh, because the features that we had were paid in those, uh, in those platforms. In fact, they don't even have AI-generated flashcards to date, and we've been able to ship that in a matter of weeks. With Milo, our goal is to sort of uh, consolidate every single use case that's uh, you know, relevant for a student and put it in one interface and let that be their lifelong learning uh, co-pilot almost. Thank you. Oh. What's the distribution strategy look like? Yeah, so the distribution is purely organic. Like I said, we're students ourselves. So with Kado, we initially started by just giving it to our friends, and then they gave it to their friends. Eventually, we started using TikTok, which ended up being a really good distribution channel for us, as well as ambassadors and campuses themselves. Uh, one of our ambassadors that was at Bocconi University, Gianluca and Tom, I'm just giving them a quick shout out. Uh, they went to their university, and we ended up selling our technology. I mean, we ended up working with them to use our technology, to create resources for all of their first year students within economics and management. So we're sort of seeing the student centric growth, uh, you know, growth cycle being developed where students are going to their schools and we're selling to the schools directly. So a little bit of a bottom up and then the people say, hey, this looks pretty good. We yeah. should get a exactly. license across. Mm -hmm. how, how is the management of like one of the things that I've observed with ed tech, I don't think this is a blanket statement across the board when it comes to the customer, but it just feels like there are like I'm, I'm making up the numbers, 100 people that can say no and only one person that can say yes. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate or give me some of your thoughts on the dynamics of the education industry? Yeah, I mean, I definitely would say it's almost accurate. I mean, I think education and especially working with universities is, you know, a little bit messy. But we've had success in doing it because we go to the professors directly. We're not looking at decision makers in the back office. We're looking at professors who have the burning need for it. You know, they don't want to sit down and create resources for their students, but they want their students to do better. Um, our technology makes that possible with no extra effort on their end. So for us, we've seen a pretty high, I mean, we've only approached a small number of, you know, professors and universities, but we've seen a pretty high, um, you know, conversion rate uh, where, you know, most universities do want to work with us and, and that cycle has been pretty short. Awesome. Thank you. Mandela? Yeah, uh, I'm in the ed tech space. Um, my qu I have so many questions, but my, the question I want to focus on first is the content. Is there any content that is not ideal for what you're building? Um, yes, mathematical content. Mm -hmm. um, so because we're a, an NLP company, um, we don't do too well with numbers and math. But what we've also found when we did our, our user interviews and as students ourselves, we found that math was a, 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 a subject area that was pretty well addressed by existing platforms. You know, Photomath does a great job. There's other platforms that do uh, similar you know, tasks to Photomath. I think math is something that we do want to focus on later down in the roadmap. For now, our focus is on humanities-based subjects, language, uh, subjects where language and, and text is pretty content heavy. Um, so, you know, history, geography, economics, these are all subjects that students either study as electives or they study, you know, compulsory during high school and beyond, uh, and we're targeting those. And that helps us in focusing on the workplace as well, you know, later on. Mm -hmm. Quick follow-up. Um, uh, Lo alluded to the challenges of ed tech. You all are 19 years old. Congratulations. Uh, why are you investing your time and talents here, of all the things you could be doing? You know, I had the idea first when I was 14 years old. So this is a, uh, a, something I've thought about since I was like a little boy. You know, when I was 14, I had the idea. I made a pitch tech when I was doing a nano degree at the time. And every year since then, I've pretty much thought about what Digest could be. And I called it the same thing. It was called Digest even back then. I only got to working on it when COVID hit and I was at home all alone. Uh, and that's when I whipped up the first MVP and I gave it to my friends. And I saw that the problem that I was facing wasn't one that was just for me. It was all my friends were facing the same problem. So, you know, this is something, a problem that I'm deeply passionate about because I've seen how it affects myself. But not just that, it affects the people around me as well. You know, we're building a product that we're proud to recommend to our peers and that we're proud to use ourselves. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. Just quick plug, Photomath is a battlefield company too. They launched in Berlin about six years ago. Okay, next. From Waterloo, Ontario, we have Swap Robotics. Presenting for Swap Robotics is founder and CEO, Tim Lichty. Come on out, Tim. Hi everybody, I'm Tim Lichty, co-founder and CEO of Swap Robotics. And our mission is to make outdoor work equipment 100% electric. The outdoor world needs to be maintained, but there are two main problems today. Legacy equipment is gasoline and diesel powered, and there's a long-term labor shortage. To help solve these problems, 
we started by creating 100% electric robots for sidewalk snow plowing, and it went well. In our second year of operation, we had 12 snow robots in operation in Canada. We charged several thousand dollars per robot per month. In the summers, we were originally going to do grass cutting for sports fields, but we kept on hearing that these massive thousand-plus-acre utility-scale solar farms were a huge headache. When we looked deeper into the problem, we learned a few things. Today, solar energy is the cheapest form of new energy. And by 2040, the world's number one power source is expected to be solar. And after a power plant is built, the biggest ongoing expense is actually cutting the vegetation and the grass on that site. When we looked at the technical perspective, we learned of a few challenges that are unique to cutting uh, solar fields. Firstly, drive lines limit typical equipment operation. The equipment needs to cut underneath panels and around the I-beams. And you need a special cutting deck to cut the thick, long vegetation uh, that exists on solar sites. A regular cutting deck just won't cut it. And so our solution, this is really fun to show, was robotic vegetation management for solar farms. But the solution is so much more long-term. We built a powerful, modular robot that can be used for not just grass cutting or snow plowing, but dozens of outdoor use cases. Let me explain how. Our, the in-house hydraulic system is built inside the robot, so it can do grass cutting and snow plowing today, but it can do dozens of use cases long-term, like street sweeping or uh, tree planting. Our quick attach system, system makes, attaching, uh, makes different attachments quick and easy. The top can be swapped. Long-term, this can enable dozens of different use cases. And batteries can be swapped in five minutes, enabling near 24-7 operation. This alone can triple monetization. The robot can hold over 1,000 pounds of load, enabling use cases that require extremely heavy loads. And getting back to solar cuts, We've developed the world's first 100% electric rough cut deck that is able to cut down extremely thick vegetation that's up to two inches in diameter. And Tony is going to hold up a, a rough cut blade and a finish cut blade just to show the difference in mass. The rough cut blade is about 10 times more mass. We also developed the world's first 100% electric offset grass cutting deck that is able to offset up to six feet to go underneath solar panels and around those I-beams. The solar world had never seen anything like this. We launched our product for solar cuts in mid-2022, and there was so much pent-up demand that within 60 days of launching, we had over $9 million in signed agreements. Not LOIs, signed agreements. So let's take a look at this robot. Going to the demo, you can see there are six emergency stop buttons. We have 360-degree cameras and other sensors. We have two-way audio, night lights, and even uh, heated windshield wipers for snow operations. And cut back to the presentation, please. By the way, there's only one other company with a product in the market for solar cuts. We've gone up against them three times since launch, and we've won every single time. Our solution is just more robust. So I'm the CEO. I've grown four companies from zero dollars to six figures of revenue each. We have four co-founders, three of whom are University of Waterloo graduates. And we have industry experience in autonomy, mechanical, electrical, and software engineering. This is the perfect team for an industry with exponential growth. And in fact, the global solar vegetation cuts market is expected to reach $50 billion by 2040. When considering that we're building an outdoor robotics platform with dozens of use cases, the total addressable market on a 20-year perspective is north of $1 trillion. So it's attracting some attention. And today, we're thrilled to announce for the first time publicly that Solve Energy 
USA's largest utility-scale solar builder has invested in us as of last Friday. We also have investment from the largest solar vegetation cutter in Texas. So we started in snow, we graduated to solar cuts, and we're building an outdoor work robotics platform. Join us in making outdoor work equipment sustainable. We're Swap Robotics. Thank you. Everyone sees the face in the front, because all I can see is a face, right? Like up top, there's the two eyes and then the nose. <laughs> no? OK. Uh, well, we'll talk about it later, Tim. Uh, Dave, let's start with you. First of all, wow. I mean, just amazing. It's, uh, it's so awesome to see entrepreneurs like your team build this. Uh, and also, I grew up in Maine, so yes, a lot, of, uh, a lot of snow being shoveled there. If you can talk a little bit about the unit economics. So yes, high level what this costs, and as you were talking about, maybe you're looking at monthly usage and you guys own it, but just tell me a little bit about how you're thinking about the unit economics. Yeah, sorry, there's a bit of an echo, but I, I think I heard the overall. Um, so the, we operate on robotics as a service, uh, which is really convenient for the customers because they're used to already paying a cost per acre. So we try to save the customer immediately from day one, 15 to 20 percent off of their cost per acre. It makes it really easy because they don't need to learn about robotics. They just get a service that works. Whereas beforehand it was gas or diesel, now it's going electric as well. And in terms of those unit economics, because we can run them as close to 24-7 as possible, we're not there yet, but over the next one to three years, we can reach $30,000 in revenue per robot per month. Uh, without going too deep into how much the robot costs us, it's uh, well under three months for a payback uh, on those robots. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. And so what does your um, go-to-market look like? Like, how do you yeah. sell to solo farms? And do any yeah. of these new investments um, introduce some strategic partnerships? Yeah, for sure. So there's three main categories of buyers. There are solar asset owners themselves. There's what's called O&Ms. So those are companies that specifically do all of the operations and maintenance uh, after a solar site is built. And then there are also the uh, kind of EPCs, or uh, sorry, uh, there's EPCs who build the sites. And then there's also the vegetation management cutters so that are just exclusively doing that. We're actually taking all three routes. So we're working with the O&Ms, the solar asset owners, and the vegetation cutters themselves. It gives, each one gives us their own advantages. Um, we're really excited about that relationship with Solve because firstly, right from day one, they understood we need to work with everybody. So that includes being able to work with all competitors. Uh, it also gives us access to hundreds of boots on the ground that their team is already, you know, they're managing hundreds of sites. And so we can really be managing these a ton. And they hate actually, uh, they don't want to have to do the vegetation cutting. It's just really difficult because logistically there aren't kind of national groups and you need permissions to get on sites and there's problems with broken panels if people aren't careful, all that kind of thing. So robotic vegetation is a very appealing in that sense. Right, thanks. Hello? Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you. A couple of questions. First question is, how quickly can the robot learn how to cut? Is this similar to like my, my iRobot at home where you know, it kind of maps out my place and then it, it's also smart enough to know if a chair moves? Oh, shoot, a chair is there now. Is that yeah, for similar sure. to how it works or is there some setup in advance? So there's a few different ways that we can run the autonomous routes. Uh, the first one, uh, just really quick and easy, is uh, teach and repeat autonomy. So we simply run the route the first time manually. It then remembers that and can repeat that. Um, that works just fine. Um, but if you're talking about scaling up to 100 sites that each might have two, 3,000 acres, you, you don't want to do that. Um, so we can also map out basically by just knowing where groups of solar arrays are. We can map that out where we've developed that software already. So it will then automatically do that without hitting those drive lines or other areas that are an issue. And then also by working with USA's largest uh, builder of solar uh, utility scale solar plants, when we know exactly where all of those I-beams are going in, then we don't even have to do that. We can just kind of import that into our overall system uh, to be able to get that started quick and easy. Cool. And just a quick follow-up. Appreciate the focus, which is important. Yes. However, maybe just your quick thoughts around the bigger vision that's possible with your technology. 
Absolutely. So we want to be really laser focused on getting to that first 100 million in annual recurring revenue. Uh, if we really want to create a huge platform over a 20 year perspective, that's the quickest way to actually do that, uh, to then have the budget for other use cases. So 90 plus percent of our focus is on those solar cuts. We are still working a little bit, but a lot less on the uh, winter uh, sidewalk snow plowing with some strategics that can do a thousand plus robots with us. Once we hit uh, $100,000 million in uh, ARR, then we'll explore other use cases. Thank you. Thank you. Great answer. Mandela. Yeah. Um, sorry, that was really loud. Uh, you so smoothly threw shade at your competition in your presentation. And so Thank my you. question is, <laughs> how ex <laughs> it was smooth. Uh, you finessed that. Um, how exactly are you more robust than the competition? Like, make it plain. I was hoping you'd ask that. So, <laughs> That was I took the bait. definitely, yeah, <laughs> that was the shade. So they're using that type of a finish cut deck. Uh, in Texas, for example, you get mesquite that sometimes is an inch or two thick. It's extremely woody. If you've ever tried cutting your backyard, that's okay if it, you've cut it in the last week or two. If you cut it for six weeks, it's going to be really slow. And once you get that really thick vegetation, it's not going to do the job. So everybody who's in the industry with traditional equipment is using these rough cut blades because you need that mass to be able to cut down thick, heavy vegetation. That's already is a knockout punch, but some of the other ways that our solution is so much more robust, it has swappable uh, batteries, so we can actually be monetizing 24-7, uh, getting several times the acreage uh, that our competitor does in any one month. And then we also have 25 inch wheels. They have 14 or 15 inch wheels. They only have two, they're on swivels. There's a lot of ways that we kind of beat the competition. Awesome. And that Thanks. takes up our time. Oh. Thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Really yeah. That's cool. Okay, from oh, London, really England, we have Hormona. Presenting for the company is Jasmine Tagesen, co-founder and COO, and Carolina Lofquist, co-founder and CEO. Welcome to the stage. Hi, I'm Jasmine, one of the co-founders of Hormona, and we're here to revolutionize women's health. This is Carolina, my co-founder and dear childhood friend. She went from having been a professional athlete to barely be able to walk the stairs without losing her breath. It took her five years and thousands of dollars to be diagnosed with hormonal imbalance, a process that was both extremely painful and very expensive. And she's not alone. Hormonal health sits at the center of women's health as every single woman is affected by our hormones. And 80% of us, that's 3.1 billion women, suffer from a hormone-related issue. By controlling the most essential body functions, our hormones play a key role for our health and affect us women on a daily basis throughout life. Our hormones are constantly changing and changing a lot. But who guides us through these massive hormonal changes? Who's there to tell us if a change is expected, normal, or abnormal? Today, no one. You wouldn't let a surgeon operate on you blindfolded, yet we are willing to let doctors make decisions on our hormonal health completely blind. Today's data on cyclical hormone levels unrelated to fertility and pregnancy isn't just thin on the ground, it barely exists. We found one study, one, that measured a woman's average hormone levels throughout the cycle where the goal wasn't to conceive. This is what we are on a mission to change. Hormona is creating the hormonal baseline that medicine will be working off of. We will change how we practice medicine and provide a much needed breakthrough in women's health, which until now has been pretty much understudied, underutilized and underfunded. You see, the problem with our hormones is that they change and they fluctuate constantly throughout the month. They need to be tested on specific days in order to be understood. Today's solution of drawing blood and waiting days for your test results is not a convenient or cost-efficient solution as you need multiple blood tests per cycle in order to discover and manage your individual hormone levels. That's why we exist. Hormona has invented a test that combined with our mobile app empowers women to understand their hormones from the comfort of our home. 
We have spent the last two years evaluating multiple testing methods, biomarkers, sample matrices, and antibodies to develop the most convenient, accurate, and affordable tests on the market. Together with our team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists, we have nailed down the three most important female hormones to test in order to determine a woman's individual hormone pattern. Unlike other companies in the industry, our patent-pending non-invasive urine tests have completely removed the need for a lab. Without sacrificing quality, we have decreased the time it takes for you to get your test results from five days to 15 minutes, and also offering a five times cheaper product. By testing regularly, Hormona can with time help to confirm if you're going into menopause, will have problems getting pregnant, or pick up any hormonal changes that may impact your life essential information that all women should have access to. Move to demo, please. Based on each individual user's cycle, the unique hormone algorithm indicates the three testing days per cycle alongside which hormone to test. So, as you can see, today it is time for me to take my estrogen test. Let's click Start Test. On the, in the morning of your indicated testing day, you simply pee in a cup, you then dip your test into the cup and the 15 minute timer will start. Since we don't have 15 minutes here today, we have prepared a second test. So, as soon as the timer goes off, you simply scan your test with your mobile camera. Our app will analyze the biomarker and then present you with a quantitative result. Back to presentation, please. The three quantitative test results per cycle allows women to see their unique hormone pattern and understand how symptoms connect to their hormone levels. They can also get tips on how to plan their life around their cycle and treatments based on their individual needs. It is the definition of an end-to-end -end solution. Regular testing and monitoring of these key hormones will enable better predictions and earlier detections of issues and conditions that are currently overlooked. If not now, well, when? The global women's health market is substantial, but it's desperately underserved, despite being part of everyday life for over 50% of the world's population. This market is a blue ocean that is currently completely untapped, making Hormona the first mover in everyday hormone health care. And the gender data gap isn't just a hole in research. It is having real-world effects on women's health right now we have the unique opportunity to contribute to narrowing that gender data gap and improve health outcomes for women all over the planet. Every single woman you know is bound to interact with hormone issues at some point in her life, and it's time we stop ignoring that fact. So, if you're a woman tired of not understanding your own body and the constant changes, take control by signing up to Hormonas Beta right now. Feeling hormonal should be the start of a conversation, not the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anne, let's start with you. Thank you. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, obviously, the more data you have, the more valuable something like this becomes. So what are some of the creative ideas that you have for customer acquisition for this app? I mean, I could talk a little bit about the data because you actually touched on a very important point. There is so little data in this field and we need to collect all that data. We're looking for ways that we can then further medical research. There are some studies done that our estrogen levels could be connected to even things like Alzheimer's, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. So if we can aid in earlier detection of some of those conditions, which we don't know that much about right now, that is such a great use of our data. And then in terms of user acquisition, um, you know, we have plenty of ways that we're looking at that. Currently, our beta is only organic users. We've got over 3,000 women in our beta. Um, but we're in discussions with partnerships, both in Europe and here, which are both employer benefits, insurance companies, other women's health companies, and things like that. Nisha. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hi. Great presentation. Hi. We love this space. We've invested in it. Um, so there are other tests like this on the market. Um, and so go-to-market is so important here. How many tests do you need a month to be a real user of this where you benefit from that data? And what is 
what is your wedge? So the, the problem with hormonal health is there are so many different moments in a woman's life and you have to figure out who to target. Like, is your wedge menopause? Is it PCOS? Is it endo endometriosis? Talk to us more about how you get that first base of loyal customers. Yep. Um, Hormona really want to cover out this new space called hormonal health, where we can follow a woman from her first period all the way to her last. And as you mentioned, that will be everything from irregular cycles, PCOS, fertility, all the way to menopause. But what we have seen in our early adopters is that women that tend to relate to the 50 symptoms that are related to hormonal imbalances uses the app the most. Um, so that can be hair loss, gain weight, acne, brain fog, and so forth, and looking for treatment to their issues. Um, and then the second question was, in terms of other tests in the market, um, there are other tests in the market focusing on fertility, but we haven't really seen a company offering quantitative tests in the way that we are doing. What's the level of accuracy versus a blood test? Yeah, so we're currently matching the gold standard, which is an at-home blood test. Um, and then we've got one more development phase before we're ready for, to launch in the market. But all of our data is pointing at a match to match, which is great. Okay. And I think you also said how many tests do you need to get value mm -hmm. out of this? You need three tests. That's the minimum baseline. So with those three tests... Three tests a month. Per month. Exactly. And you can, can reuse it? It's or you one only use test. it three times a month? Yeah. Use it three times a month. And on specific days, that's what's unique about our product. We really tell you, based on what your cycle length is and what your conditions are, we tell you when to test. Um, and we want you to test for a minimum of three months so that we know that you just didn't have an off month where you were extra stressed and you know your hormones were a bit off. So a minimum of three months, three tests per month, so it's not that overbearing. Great, thanks. Mandela? Yeah, I had the same question as Nisha. Um, I was just thinking about my own lived experience of when I've been really act, an active user on apps and it's really around ovulation and when I'm, you know, into, I'm hoping to get pregnant. And then once I get pregnant, I kind of put the app aside and I don't use it again. So same similar question of like, to someone like me who feels like I'm fairly healthy, knock on wood, what's the, is, are you making a pitch to me that even someone like me who feels like they're healthy needs this? And what's the pitch to me? Yeah, I mean, from the early adopters that we have so far, we've seen that women find it as important as track their calories or the steps. They want to keep track of their hormones to make sure that they're balanced all the time. So the pitch to you would probably, with our app and with our tests, you can make sure that your hormones are at the optimal level, but also get daily insight how to be the best version or live with your hormones, basically. Thank you. Great. Dave? Uh, thanks for doing what you do. Um, the uh, the pea stick is that specific? You guys invented that, or you're licensing other technology? If you can talk a little bit about how long you've been working on that, because I mean, wow, I can see it's much easier than a blood test. Yeah, so we own all the IP of our test. We've spent the last two years developing it from scratch. Um, what's really unique about us is that it's quantitative, so it can match a blood test. It's not just a yes or a no. Um, but we, we own all the IP, we have pending patents on it, um, both here in the US and design patents as well. Great. Hello? Yeah, just curious for the women that are using the alternative method of doing the blood test, like how many women are actually doing that at home? Is there a percentage of, of women that's part of your research? They're taking a home blood test? Yes. Um, so it's a good question. I think in general the system is a little bit broken because when it comes to testing your hormones, you actually need to test it on specific days in order to understand what's going on. Uh. And if you go to a doctor today, they test all your hormones on the same day. And that's one of the reasons why I started a company uh, due to the fact that I was suffering from hormonal imbalances for quite many years before I actually got a diagnosis. Um, so I would say today's solutions doesn't really work when it comes to hormonal health. You, you actually, t my follow-up question was touched upon <laughs> because my next question was going to be, well then, where else are women doing it? And I would assume that it's some regular checkup, which is probably much further away than the cadence that's desired on your end to kind of provide the baseline and to identify anomalies quicker. Exactly. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of women feel dismissed by their doctors because you won't get these tests. Like you do one set of tests and it looks fine. And then there is no more investigation. But it, because you didn't test it on the right day, it doesn't right. necessarily make sense. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Give them a round of applause.
That was very good. Okay, we have one more company in this round, but we're going to be back tomorrow with two more rounds and ten more companies. So, presenting from San Francisco, California, we have Stack. Presenting for Stack is Nikki Bar <laughs> Barnussi, founder and CEO, and Victoria and Lucy Le Yang. Come on out. Is connected that way. Eight out of ten of us have sent cash to a friend using a peer to peer payment service. That's over 150 million users transacting 1.2 trillion just this year alone. And two thirds of those users have cash balances in their app. But who really benefits from those cash balances? Well, with inflation hitting a 40-year high of 9.1% in June, if you left idle cash in there, you just took a cut. And it's those same peer-to-peer -peer apps that are benefiting from cash balances and earning a return, leaving nothing behind for their users. But it doesn't have to be that way. Millennials, Gen Z, all of us want to earn and grow our wealth, but sometimes just lack the resources, time, or energy or resources to invest. So that's why we have built an alternative. What if your investment journey could start with something so simple as a peer-to-peer -peer payback? Your roommate paying you back rent in Apple stock. Your burrito lunch date paying you back in Chipotle stock. What if peer-to-peer -peer paybacks wasn't just a way to settle tabs, but was a way to actually build generational wealth? Coming from an investment background at KKR and McKinsey, I've had experience overseeing an $800 million portfolio. My co-founding team brings experience to the table from companies like Coinbase, Goldman Sachs, and even the White House. Introducing Stax, the first peer-to-peer -peer payment designed to generate wealth with every single transaction. Please move to demo. So I went out to dinner with Lucy in the Marina District last night, and we got this delicious pasta. And she covered the bill, so I want to pay her back. I go into her profile page, and I hit Pay or Request. I can enter an amount and a description, and I hit Pay. Now here, her top five favorite stocks pop up, and I can choose whatever I want to pay her in. So let's go ahead and choose Tesla and hit Next. Confirm, and it's as easy as that. I just contributed to her long-term wealth goals just by going out to dinner with her. I can also request stock in the same manner. So I go to Lucy's page, I hit a dollar amount, I put in a comment, and I hit request. And in that same way, my top five favorite stocks pop up and I can choose what I'd like to get paid in. Please move back to deck. Before, sending stock was extremely difficult. The sender paid taxes, filled out paperwork, there were high fees and tons of delays. It wasn't for the everyday investor, and there were so many friction points. But at Stacks, we built a fast, simple, and secure way to send stock, and we're making it the new norm and bringing it mainstream. When I send Lucy stock, it comes out of my account as cash and enters her account as cash on the back end. It only converts to stock once she clicks accept in her notifications tab. So let me show you how that's done. Please move to demo. So Lucy, Lucy goes into her notifications tab and she sees a transaction from me in there. She can decline or accept. So let's go ahead and click accept. She has a few options in here. She can accept the stock as is, she can switch the stock to another one of her favorites, or she can accept it as cash. So let's go ahead and accept the Tesla stock. In this very moment, the cash on the back end converts to stock and starts investing for her. Let's just say one morning Lucy wakes up and she decides, oh, Tesla is a little too volatile for me. I'm gonna go ahead and choose to accept it as cash, which is a great alternative for us on our platform. Stacks is also social, and we make all portfolios and trades and transactions public, so you can like and comment 
on various transactions, and this is truly to engage in conversation about investing in your community. The ultimate goal here is to make investing less lonely. And we create data transparency that other platforms conceal and close off to their users. And by giving this power of data back to the users, we are truly democratizing investing. Back to DEC. So not only is Stack super fun in ways that you can grow your own wealth, but you can contribute to your peers' wealth and actually see it grow as well. So at Stacks, we're thinking of other ways to grow people's wealth, and we go beyond just peer-to-peer -peer payments. Imagine a driver accepting shares of stock as they ride around via their rideshare app. Or imagine a bride and groom accepting shares of stock as gifts via their registry service. Even businesses will be able to plug into Stacks. And unlike other P2P apps, like Venmo, we've got you covered. We cover up to 250K of user cash balances and 500K of portfolio investments using our brokerage partner, Alpaca. And this is to make sure that our users feel 100% safe and confident when investing with us long term. Stacks dramatically changes the way people pay and invest by allowing anyone to turn every payment into an investment. By taking the habit that already exists of peer-to-peer -peer payments and supercharging it with the ability to invest, we're bringing a whole new group of individuals into the markets and creating new ways that they can access it. So businesses, if you're interested in incorporating investments into your payments platform, contact us at hello at stacksapp.com. And for everyone else, scan using the QR code and download us today on the iOS App Store with the exclusive code Stacks TechCrunch and get started investing today. Join us as we create limitless value with every single transaction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nikki. Dave, can we start with you? Yeah, can you just talk a little bit about the setup? You mentioned Alpaca is your partner, and so uh, you need to get cash into to Stacks, and then you need to maybe set up a brokerage account. If you can talk just a little bit about getting set up on your product. Yeah, definitely. So when you're getting set up with Stacks, um, we're like any other brokerage requires us to verify your identity, uh, which goes through the KYC or know your customer process. So in that sense, you're kind of creating your own Alpaca account or a brokerage account uh, through Stacks. And that uh, allows you to also trade on our platform so you can buy, sell, as well as send and receive stocks. I have a kind of a uh, related question. Thanks, guys. This is great. Um, Anne asked another contestant or uh, about kind of network effects. And there were two points in here that I'm sort of struggling to get my head around. One is um, there's like a bit of chicken and egg, which you sort of have to have stocks to be able to pay someone. And someone can also choose to reject getting the stocks. So how do you think about creating this initial sort of liquidity in this payment app? Like who are your early users um, that are creating that network effect? Yeah, and you make a really great point. Uh, and what we've done right now is that we allow any user, you don't have to own a specific stock to be able to send it. So in our process, you're actually sending cash from one user's account to another. And when the other the recipient accepts the cash, it converts it to stock. So we're basically cutting that, that journey when you're thinking about investing uh, and bringing it down to like immediate. So you guys are making the purchase. Yes, on, on the, the back end, the cash converts to stock once you click accept. So it's up to the receiver and it, the power is in the receiver's hand to and change. Are you, are you taking Sorry. a cut on the transaction or what's Currently we do not, yeah. Okay. So how do you make money? Yeah, we're really thinking about different ways of profitability. Currently, we're thinking about acquisition. So our main goal is to get as many users on the app, find value, um, and then in other ways, think about how to make money from that. Yeah. So I think uh, long-term goals, we do think about transaction costs or um, other ways of making money in terms of like ACH and things like that. Yeah, and on the back end, there is a way to do it transparently transparency to, to the FOF model, which is payment for order flow. It's a pretty valid model in terms of a lot of brokerages. They use that, except they take advantage of the user funds, and they don't do the correct spread between the bid and the ask. And so they take more than they, they should. So that's Robinhood and all these other platforms. Yeah. We want to be extremely transparent to our users on how much we're taking on the back end and be com completely ethical about that. So that's what makes us really different. Stacks is really about transparency and giving the, p the power back to the user. So we want to make sure we're creating revenue in an ethical way, unlike other brokerages. Thanks. 
Well, yeah, I'm thinking about um, what obviously pops up for everybody's Venmo and acorns that I have. And I'm thinking about Venmo, I, I have a lot of movement in that app mm -hmm. every day, right? I look at my balance, I'm like, there's money in there. Then I look at who I owe, pay, 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 or I send it to back to my bank account, right? And so I'm not incentivized to keep money, right, on the app. And then when I think about acorns, the automation setup, it's pulling from my checking account every so often, it's going into the funds. So what do you anticipate is gonna be the user behavior on this app? given what people are already used to when it comes to holding stock and not just, you know, um, anyway, you get the question. Yeah, definitely. I think um, what we really want to do is build out a whole banking ecosystem, and it starts with peer-to-peer -peer payments. So when we think about banking ecosystem, you have your company that you bank with, like your checking or savings account, we kind of integrate that into Stacks, as well as your investment platform. So we're kind of feeding our new users, young people who are getting started investing or kind of like hesitant about investing, dipping into their feet into investing, and then bringing them into our whole ecosystem of products. So we're eventually building out a platform where we hope to, you know, bring users and give them value in many ways. So that includes like any interest from your banking, from the cash you have with Stacks, as well as your investments growing over time. Yeah, and what you said there is like, key in terms of network effect. Uh, what we bring to the table is very different in terms of other brokerage platforms in terms of the social component. So we see a lot of user engagement in the social side of things and how they like to contribute to their friends' wealth or comment or like or engage in uh, community conversations. Great. Hello? Yeah, uh, very clever, interesting. A couple of questions. The first question is just at a high level, what's your policy on, on data? Who owns it? Who's it shared with? And then the, is it Alpaca, is that the? Correct. Are they, second question, are they purely back office without any customer facing activity? Yeah, you make a really point. So we use Alpaca, which is our brokerage partner. Uh, they handle all of the KYC processing, our users' information, and so we kind of use them to build out the brokerage and the compliance side of our product. Um, and they've worked with many other companies before in terms of um, companies that are going into the investing space, and so we really trust them as a partner. And then your policy on data usage, who's owning it, who's using it? Yeah, great question. So we basically don't store all of our information, user information, to our database. Um, we store some information such as like your username, passwords, and things like that, but we use a, um, a third-party API to store our information. Yeah, and our ultimate goal here is to become our own brokerage, so we would be eventually moving off Alpaca and um, owning all that data and building out stacks. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Thank Last you. question to Ann. Why do you think this is gonna be a generational app for Gen Z? It's a good question. So the way that Gen Z moves and thinks is very differently, the attention span is different. If you're looking at Gen Z, for example, they're not gonna buy a pair of jeans off of an ad on TV. They're gonna buy a pair of jeans off TikTok of their favorite influencer wearing it and someone they can relate to and they trust. So the way that they think is very different and Stacks caters to this group of people because you're following um, otherwise people who wouldn't talk about financial decisions or investing, it's all transparent. And you can follow influencers who are making trades that you trust and you can mimic those trades and understand what they're doing with their finances. So instead of reading CNBC, CNBC or like Fox News or articles about stocks, they prefer peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, information and that aspect of it is, is really the key component of Gen Z right there. Right. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. Well, that concludes the, the second round of Startup Battlefield.